Okay, so uh, with uh, out further ado, you can see what it is there. Microwave engineering from death rays to dinner. William Eustace, it's all yours. Today we're going to go on a little journey through some rather exotic parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. We begin with a brief exposition of the very early history of modern electromagnetics, but first, a definition for all of you. Microwaves uh, range in definitions. I, I heard it recently defined as anything less than a foot in wavelength. I favor frequency. Uh, if nothing else, it's less susceptible to imperialization. Uh, and uh, we can go from 1 to 100 gigahertz. But I, I favor that definition. Others are available. Beyond that, you get into terahertz and uh, indeed well into millimeter wave bands. And uh, it has a variety of uses. Those we're going to touch on today are specifically radar at great length, weaponry in a somewhat hypothetical direction, communications, which, of course, I think some people in this room might know something about, and heating, which, as uh, a student myself, I am naturally an expert on. But uh, anyway, we begin with a set of pictures. And uh, on the far left here, is Michael Faraday. Faraday had remarkably little mathematical ability. He was, in fact, quite well known for it. But he nonetheless fathered modern electromagnetic theory with his discovery of electromagnetic induction. And these principles were fairly swiftly encoded by the brilliant mathematician and physicist James Clerk Maxwell. And he formulated uh, the laws of electromagnetism, as he perceived them, adding a few touches of his own, into around 20 simultaneous equations. This is, needless to say, a bit of a handful. Uh, but fortunately, in latter years, he refined it down to four or five. And uh, he used the language of quaternions, which is a brilliantly mathematical system for dealing with multidimensional problems. Unfortunately, also rather difficult for anybody who hasn't develop the theory himself to use. So we come to Oliver Heaviside, who had just two years of formal education. I believe he was at school from the ages of 12 to 14. And yet, he was a fantastic engineer, physicist, and mathematician. It's thanks to Heaviside that we have transmission line theory. He invented and indeed first patented the coaxial cable. And he also reformulated Maxwell's equations into the beautiful form in which we see them here in vector calculus, or as my lecturer last year would have put it, being a, a Scotsman, vector calculus. We then come to a face which may be less familiar, uh, because this on the right is Jagadish Chandra Bose. And I think he deserves a slide of his own in a presentation like this. Chandra Bose came to London from his uh, native India in 1880 to study medicine at UCL, but by some artifice I have yet to ascertain the details of, a year later he found himself at Christ's College, Cambridge, reading natural sciences. He graduated with a, a bachelor's degree and went back to assume a professorship at Presidency College, Calcutta. Now that's rapid promotion if ever you heard it. And uh, he was a very brilliant man and contributed to a wide variety of fields. In fact, one of his students at Presidency College was another Mr. Bose, S.N. Bose. And anyone, I'm sure most of you, who are familiar with the delightfully refined field, I must confess I know nothing of it, of quantum statistics, will doubtless have heard of Bose-Einstein condensates and uh, Bose-Einstein statistics, which are important thermodynamic concepts in that range, I'm told by my physicist friends. Um, Bose did, however, make some direct contributions, and uh, he fathered the world of microwaves in some respects, because in the 1890s, he built a 60 gigahertz spark gap-based transmitter and was, use, and was the very first to use a semiconductor junction to detect radio waves. So he was quite ahead of his time already. He went on to use waveguides, uh, to, uh, to use polarizing grids, and indeed, uh, dielectric lenses, all of which were concepts that we didn't see again for some time. So, uh, a very great and noticeable man. In fact, he did most of his microwave research, including building this in a cupboard next to a bathroom in his college at Calcutta. But now, now we skip on a few years, and we get on, oh dear, to a broken PowerPoint presentation. Uh, this is Christian Hulsmeyer. And uh, in, 19, in, in the early, tw early 20th century, he witnessed 
the outcome, at least, of a collision on the River Weser in northern Germany in thick fog between two ships in which uh, somebody from his village was killed. And he, being an inventive type, thought he could do something about it and developed a system to use... In fact, I have the full title of uh, one patent here, Hertzian wave projecting and receiving apparatus adapted to indicate or give warning of the presence of a metallic body, such as ships or train, in the line of projecting of such waves. Uh, now we might call it radar, uh, which is a little snappier, but effectively it rang a bell. He first demonstrated this on a bridge, and indeed it did manage to ring a bell when a ship went underneath. Uh, this is the... wrong screen. This is the telemobiloscope uh, patent, and uh, it has some of the the uh, equipment we might recognize today. It features a rotating antenna, it has some sort of RF generator and detector, but uh, for whether it was just ahead of its time or perhaps a little too primitive, it never really caught on. Uh, I'm re pleased to report uh, that Hulsmeyer, who filed uh, around 160 patents in his life, not only didn't die penniless, as is the way of many of these brilliant inventors ahead of their time, he in fact lived to see radar become a wide stream uh, area of research and made quite a bit of money in his inventions in the fields of boiler making, metallurgy and light bulbs. So, clearly a versatile mind. But uh, a quick aside. Uh, we move on now to the 1930s, and for this I must make a quick apology because I am now going to talk, as the more perceptive of you after lunch may have noticed, I uh, hopefully haven't all gone to sleep yet, about radar. And what we're building towards is the British story of radar, but this is not to say there were not as many others around the world as you care to mention. The Germans certainly had very sophisticated radar in the war, as did a number of other nations. The French were working on it at some sizable rate and made a number of contributions. The Soviets, we're not quite sure what they were doing, or at least I'm not, but uh, they had something up their sleeve, and the Americans had made tentative experiments which they didn't really pursue in the 1920s about detecting aircraft with radio. But uh, this was what we were thinking about in the 1930s. Get a great big mirror made out of concrete, stick a microphone in the middle of it, and you can hear them coming. That's a wonderful idea, and these are actually still down on the south coast at Hythe, um, and Dimchurch, that area. But unfortunately, uh, there was a slight snag, which was the aircraft nowadays were actually flying at a considerable speed. They weren't airships trundling along. So by the time you'd worked out what it was and heard it coming, it would probably already have dropped its bombs before any fighters got in the air. But what it did lead to was the development of what we may now recognize as the Dowding system for escalating this massive set of information from along the coast up to fighter command and then disseminating it back to, uh, back to fighters so they could go and intercept the incoming aircraft. And it is the Dowding system that many of you may recognize from war films with the group of wrens or wafts gathered around a plotting table pushing things about with long sticks. There was another concern as well. Uh, Nikola Tesla, uh, many years earlier, uh, warned that he had a death ray, but conveniently failed to say anything more about it. Um, in fact, a lot of inventors had said they had death rays, and the Ministry of Defence at the time uh, was getting a bit fed up with them all saying, we can give you a death ray if you give me a few hundred pounds to develop it. So they set uh, a prize, which was a hundred pounds, immediately, without further question, for anyone who could kill a sheep at a hundred yards. As A.P. Rowe, a scientist and civil servant, commented rather dryly and in perhaps a slightly disappointed voice in one book of his, the mortality rate of sheep was unaffected. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, there were serious concerns about this, and uh, Harry Wimperis, who was a uh, senior civil servant, I believe, and uh, led a committee to look at possible technical aspects of the war, uh, asked Robert Watson Watt, who we see here, who was at the time a leading researcher at the... Uh, radio research establishment in Slough to have a look into this whole business. And uh, Watson Watt should be of particular note even to uh, HF amateurs. Are there any HF people in the room? Hurrah, jolly good. Uh, and because he in fact coined the term ionosphere, which of course uh, many of us may have, many of you may have heard somewhere. He passed these on to his assistant, Arnold Wilkins, and he had a go at calculating whether this might be possible. And uh, I think we're going to have a go at doing the same. So 
Uh, we'll keep the maths fairly low. I know it's after lunch, so, you know, can't go too far. Uh, I don't know whether they were serving wine in the canteens, though. But um, let's, let's make some really generous assumptions. Our pilot weighs about 70 kilos, but he's a very large cross-sectional area. I mean, you know, he likes his, uh, likes his beer or something. And uh, we want to heat him up by about 2 centigrade to make him at least distinctly uncomfortable. And let's, let's make a further generous assumption. Let's say he's going to sit 600 metres away for 10 minutes. I'm, maybe we can achieve this somehow, put it in an aeroplane and fly it behind him or something. But uh, it is obviously a bit of a questionable thing to assume just from the start. And we find that we need to put in about 59 kilowatts of power in order to get that heating rate. That's into the pilot. So if you assume that he absorbs all the energy that goes past him, which is not really going to happen if you think about it, but let's not get into the finer details. If you have no gain in your antenna, you're going to need uh, a few hundred gigawatts of power. Uh, for comparison, a typical nuclear power station might chuck out a couple of megawatts, so uh, this is, is going to be a little hard to realise, but uh, fortunately, antenna gain is usually there, well, has to be there in some form, and so we can add in some gain. Unfortunately, uh, if we can put out two megawatts, so we have somehow managed to convert the full output of nuclear power station, which hasn't been invented yet, into RF, and direct it at this person, we need 59 dBi of gain, uh, 51 dBi of gain. Remember that at the time, anything over about 100 megahertz was considered microwave and virtually unobtainable, at least by British valve technology. Uh, the Germans, in fact, during the war got valves that operated up to about 570 megahertz. But generating this much power at any frequency where you could have an antenna with even approaching that much gain was really unthinkable at the time. But uh, Wilkins, uh, Arnold Wilkins, who is not pictured but should be really, uh, because he was a sizable contributor, suggested they might consider what comes back. And uh, so we, we can reflect on this a little. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and, and so if we look at the power going out, I, I, I did promise there wouldn't be too much maths, but bear with me, I promise. It's fine. Uh, we stick some power out, and it radiates. And uh, it decays as the inverse square law, which is why we've got the 4 pi r squared on the bottom there and it hits our target, which has some area. Let's assume, generously speaking, that the target radiates all of that energy back in an isotropic fashion. So it spews it out everywhere, but all of it gets reflected. We then have some power coming back, and we have an antenna of some area, and we gather in the power to that antenna. But once again, it decays by the inverse square law on the way back. Trouble is, we don't tend to measure our antennas in terms of area, so you can apply a little identity and get to gain instead, and we end up with what is generally referred to as the radar equation. Now, don't worry if you didn't follow any of that, because there is only one thing about the radar equation you really need to look at, and that is this, r to the 4. And that, not to put too wide a point on it, is a real pain in the neck. Because if your target goes twice as far away, and you want to receive the same power level back, suddenly you need a factor of 16 increase in power. And that isn't necessarily how easy to come by. But uh, work began fairly quickly. Uh, they, they liked the idea. They thought, does it work? So this being a cutting edge experiment, uh, this was the aircraft selected for the test, uh, the Handley Page Hayford, uh, the very last, uh, I believe, the last, bi the last uh, heavy biplane in RAF service. And uh, it flew over the BBC Empire Service transmitter at Daventry. And uh, in a field somewhere down there with uh, a van with an enormous amount of receiving equipment in the back sat Arnold Wilkins, watched by uh, one or two officials at most. And uh, he managed to demonstrate that this little blip on his fairly newly developed cathode ray oscilloscope wobbled up and down as the aircraft approached. And they detected it at a range of some eight miles. But of course, knowing it's there and knowing where it is, what height it is, and how fast it's going are two very different problems. So a bit of further development was needed, and uh, it, it happened. By Good Friday 1939, uh, Chain Home came into operation. And this is an absolutely phenomenally famous system. I'm sure most of you have heard of it. But it had a few drawbacks. It operated at around 10 meters wavelength. It used a certain amount of off-the-shelf broadcast equipment. And uh, it had about 100 kilowatts of pulsed output power, which was very good by the standards of the day. Unfortunately, here we see the antennas. They're just a trifle cumbersome, aren't they? These uh, metal lattice towers are 360 feet high, and there are three of them with a massive curtain antenna array strung between them. 
And in the distance here, in this rather lovely painting, you can see three of the four 240-foot wooden receiving towers. Not exactly a system you're going to stick on an aeroplane, is it? But um, it, it, it worked. Uh, one of the differences to most modern radar is that this transmitting array was completely fixed. It sent out a massively wide floodlight of radio waves. It didn't focus like a, like a modern radar will, but we'll see a little more about that later. But over time, they got the power up, and you know, if you work through the radar equation, you get about five microwatts back if you make some reasonable assumptions about aircraft reflectivity and so forth. And uh, we end up with a range of about 100 kilometers. So that, that's good. Gives you some warning. I don't know whether I really need this slide, but I'm going to throw it, show it anyway, just to clarify matters, because the fundamental principle of radar is really very simple. You send out a pulse, or a shout, as uh, various people have described it over the years, bounces off your target, whether that's an aeroplane, or a cloud, or a raindrop, or a bird, and it comes back. And you measure the amount of time, you measure the direction, and you measure, if you can, the elevation. And Shane Home actually sent out a, a series of stacked uh, lobes in the vertical axis so you could get some idea of the elevation of the aircraft. And uh, it worked. It had a few problems. If you flew low, you could evade it, and they developed a separate system just to get around that. But fundamentally, it was quite effective. And surely this is basically job done. You know, you, um, th this is a map of coverage as of 1930, uh, about 1940, I think. And as you can see, it stretches, protective guard stretches all the way around from the Isle of Wight all the way up to Scarpa Flow in the north, looking after Britain's coastline. And the theory is very straightforward. You scramble these brave gentlemen, and off they go and defend, uh, the, defend their homes. And uh, indeed, they did very effectively. And during the Battle of Britain, sometimes the Dowding system and chain home and uh, fighter command achieved intercept rates up to 100%. Unfortunately, then the Germans made a very acute observation. You see, at night, it tends to get dark. And the result, of course, was the horrors of the, the Blitz. And uh, the latter photograph is uh, Coventry Cathedral, which stands in a uh, fairly similar condition today as a memorial uh, in much the same fashion as the Gedenkniskirche in Berlin. A reminder, perhaps, that neither side really solved the problem of defending against bombers at night in a completely satisfactory way during the war. The obvious solution was you needed radar on the aeroplane. Because it's all very well saying, there's an aeroplane over here at Angels 20, but you know, you can only see it from 300 meters away in the dark over blacked out Britain, especially if there's no moon. So what are you going to do about it? You fly around in circles for hours and it might have gone past ages ago. No, you want radar. Watson Watt was not what you might describe as a perfectionist. In fact, I suppose he was something of a, a, a classical engineer. He rather famously suggested that you should give them the third best to go on with. The second best is too late. And the first and the best never comes at all. Uh, and airborne intercept was very much predicated on this, uh, on this idea. It was initially based around a modified television receiver, the receiver side, and uh, a customized transmitter. And uh, it worked at a bit under two meters, so it was very high frequency, uh, but still virtually DC by comparison to modern radars. Oh dear, sorry, I had that. Have, have any, has any of you been able to hear me throughout? To the back? You want to sleep there? Oh good, right, you could have let a chap know. Uh, oh, well, uh, I'll just have to keep talking loudly then. Never mind. Okay, so, uh, this first flew in 1937, once again in the venerable Handley Page Hayford, and they strung in the first set these long antenna arrays, wire antenna arrays, between the landing gear, just to get it on there somehow. It was a constant fight throughout the war between aircraft designers who wanted things beautifully streamlined and radar engineers who wanted antennas sticking out everywhere. But uh, the aircraft engineers lost to some sizable extent because a lot of aircraft later did have antennas sticking out everywhere. But to begin with, this had some serious problems because the minimum range was far too big. That doesn't sound like much of a problem. Surely maximum range is what you want. But no, chain home could get you within a kilometer or two. But to home the final distance until you made visual contact at that critical range of 300 meters, you needed quite short pulses. You needed quite short pulses and quite 
high-performance receivers that were ready to listen as soon as it came back. And unfortunately, this being a modified television receiver, it tended to ring with interference from the transmit pulse for so long that it missed the signal coming back from the fighter air, from the bomber at a few hundred metres away. Uh, they fixed it eventually, and they uh, started being installed in serious numbers in uh, mid-1940, but it was a bit late for the blitz, and so peak intercept rates achieved were sort of 3 to 5 percent uh, with some assistance from AI. But later it became uh, quite a tenable system. But, of course, the thing you perhaps are all waiting for is this device on the right. And uh, hands up who recognises this. Uh, you've, you've all got one in your kitchen, I should think. This is the cavity magnetron. And uh, this was patented, as everybody knows, a great British invention, patented by Dr. Hans Holman in 1935 in Berlin. Um, actually, that's a bit unfair. It was first patented in America in about 1910, and Hans Holman patented some refinements. Unfortunately, neither of them could get a particularly usable amount of power out of it until Messrs. Randall and Boot, working at Birmingham University, managed finally to solve the thermal and power output issues in 1940. And the result was kilowatts of power at hitherto unimaginable wavelength, 10 gigahertz, 3 centimetre wavelength. Fantastic, because now your antennas get rather small, and that means putting it on an aeroplane, no problem. But also, let's say you're detecting a river or a building, if, your wavelength, if the wavelength of your radar is equivalent to the length of the building, you have a hard time getting very good resolution. But as you shrink the wavelength down, suddenly things start to get better. Well, it it uh, operates uh, somewhat, uh, it is a thermionic valve, and uh, as such is, of course, as uh, somebody uh, with an M0 call sign, totally beyond my understanding. But uh, it works on effectively sending a stream of electrons whizzing round and round and exciting various resonant modes in these cavities, which are tuned by sizing them correctly. Um, it, the Germans knew about it, and they decided it wouldn't ever work because you couldn't make it sufficiently frequency stable. And in fact, I believe during the war, German scientists were largely forbidden from working on frequencies above a gigahertz because it was thought to be a waste of time. But uh, not so, because, uh, as I say, in uh, 1940, they were getting 10 kilowatts output at 10, at, uh, 10 gigs, uh, 10 centimeters, sorry, important difference. Eh? <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, their first apparatus came with a vacuum pump because it had to be continuously evacuated during use, so it wasn't quite production ready. And here come the Americans. Uh, the Tizard Committee, this is uh, Henry Tizard, uh, who was once proctor of Imperial College for a while, uh, actually, uh, he, he and his committee took a series of British inventions to America to give freely in exchange for help with production and uh, general war assistance. And uh, these included uh, Whittle's jet engine plans, which uh, were uh, gratefully received, and a working cavity magnetron, which was described by one American si uh, official sometime later as possibly the most valuable cargo ever brought to our shores. Well, the Americans uh, were quite keen, and indeed they did an awful lot of production of the magnetron and radar-related devices, but they also founded the Rad Lab, the MIT Radiation Laboratory. We see some uh, enthusiastic individuals down here on the bottom left uh, tinkering away. And the radiation lab was so named because they, they thought, we're going to get a bunch of crack physicists together to work on microwave stuff. And we don't want to call it anything that could be misconstrued for a warlike purpose, in case the Japanese or the Germans hear about it. Uh, what could be unrelated to the war? Ah, nuclear physics! That'll never be any good for warlike purposes. So, uh, the radiation lab it was. And um, in, in the middle here, uh, we see a, uh, an, air, an allied aircraft shooting at a U-boat. And this was realized, to some extent, with the magnetron and American-assisted radars. A lot of the ASV, this is anti-submarine vessel radar, was designed actually at Swanage and in Malvern at the various uh, radar, radar research establishments in the UK. But a lot of the production assistance came from the States. And it was thanks to that and uh, the earlier efforts in that direction that the war in the Atlantic was largely won. Anyway, uh, on a lighter note, we come to the end of the war, and uh, we have perhaps the heyday of communications, radio communications, at least in terms of the variety of spectrum used. HF was still in regular use for commercial and high-traffic long-distance stuff. Microwave links around the country and indeed uh, across Europe were being developed because it was believed more resilient than uh, copper-based communications. And, of course, radar development carried on. But another interesting project is Telstar. Now, uh, I, I don't remember Telstar, I'm afraid, myself, but uh, here, here you see it in action. And this had a four to six gigahertz microwave, four and six gig microwave links down to the ground, and it was the very first television relay satellite. Uh, 
It was, in fact, really, uh, as with so much of the American space program, uh, facilitated largely by the US military. And uh, they've always been very delicate experimentalists, so they launched it uh, on about, I believe it was the 1st of, Ju uh, 1st of July. And a few days later, at a totally unrelated test, they thought, I wonder what happens if we put a big nuclear fusion bomb into the upper atmosphere and blow it up. And they did this in Starfish Prime, and uh, it created artificial aurora at the equator. It knocked out all the telephones 1,500 kilometers away in Hawaii, and it created a massive band of radiation in the Van Allen belts, through which, fairly shortly afterwards, Telstar passed and conked out. In fact, I think it is probably safe to say that the US military are the only researchers in history to have shot themselves in the foot with a thermonuclear weapon. <laughs> well, I, I promised you to take you from death rays to dinner, and now we come, you'll be relieved here, towards the end of that journey. Uh, Percy Spencer was a Raytheon engineer uh, who worked on magnetron development, and he was strolling along in 1946 one day in one of his uh, test sites, and uh, he noticed a peanut bar in his pocket was beginning to melt. Uh, now he thought, well, I wonder what could be doing that. And then it occurred to him he was standing next to a magnetron. Now, the, many of you may share my apprehension as to what this was doing to him as well. Uh, I think those of you who have worked with high-power microwaves may be aware they tend to affect uh, the low blood flow parts of the body, which in men, specifically the eyes and the testicles. Uh, I have no record of his ophthalmological health, but he did have three children, so maybe it wasn't too bad. Um, Initially, this was predicated for commercial applications only because they were ridiculously expensive and even then they were a bit of a fad. Uh, by 1955, the price was down to, in modern terms, just $12,000. And uh, it was the, and shortly afterwards, the Amana Raider range was marketed for the very first time in the late 60s at a, a price now around $4,000. Uh, but this actually gained quite a cult following, and they have a website, a fan site, for the Amana Raider Range microwave oven. So if, if you thought uh, that, uh, that you were doing something eccentric by coming here this weekend, I, I don't know whether they have a convention, but maybe we should go. Um, for, for comparison, the modern Raider Range is now down to, t or the modern equivalent microwave by the same manufacturer, is now down to 270 US dollars. I was going to show you a spectacular advert for the Raider Range, but I don't think I have time, because we must press on. I promised death rays to dinner, but wait, there's more, because uh, there has been quite a lot that's happened since. And perhaps the most noteworthy thing to mention is the transistor. Uh, we've really seen the impact of this in radio, but we had to wait a bit longer than everyone else because of the classic problems surrounding capacitance and feedback of that capacitance to, de to degrade the gain of devices. But, uh, you know, we started to see microwave BJTs in the 1960s, and uh, high-power applications had to wait a bit. So um, there's this splendid paper from 1971 in which uh, Mr. Cook, doubtless very correctly for the time, comments that uh, microwave power transistors are useless, really, above 4 gigahertz. Well, that ain't so now, and uh, we see routinely uh, silicon, uh, gallium, sorry, gallium arsenide and gallium nitride power applications up to 100 gigahertz and even more, and uh, of course power applications certainly up to uh, 20 or 30 gigs are uh, not uncommon. But uh, it had another impact as well, which we may discuss very briefly later if, there's, if I have time. And uh, the other development in radar, because I'm, I'm moving back into radar for a moment, is electronic beam forming. We tend to think of a radar as a dish a bit like this that goes round and round and round. And, you know, mesmerizing as they are to watch, it's all terribly mechanical. And obviously, electronic engineers never really like mechanical things, so uh, we get, try and get rid of them. And uh, the, way, the way this has been achieved is by observing that at typical military frequencies nowadays, a dipole is pretty small. Go to 20 gigs, it's less than a centimeter, a tiny little thing. And so you can get rather a lot of them on quite a small space. And if you apply a phase shift between each set of antennas or each antenna on your big array of lots of antennas, then you can steer the beam in effectively in software or at least in electronics. And it's a, it's a brilliant idea, but it's not totally new. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the two-slit experiment, young slits, which effectively is the same thing. You have interference from two sources, and depending on whether the phase adds, or uh, adds creatively or destructively, you get a diffraction pattern. But uh, there have been some changes since. Um, transistors have made it possible to have small amplifiers, and we'll see a case of that in just a moment. And the TR module has come in, uh, more of which, once again, very shortly. But first, back to the war. Because in 1942, the Germans 
as I say, they were not idle through our radar development, uh, had this in service. And this is the very first phased array radar, it's Mammoth. Uh, this is a massive array, and it worked at about two meters wavelength. And this was a phased array antenna. It swept a narrow beam through an angle of about 100 degrees, and it did this using a steering pedestal, a bit like a ship's wheel, which controlled a mechanical phase shifting element in a bunker underneath. Uh, I haven't a photograph of it here, but uh, there are some online, which is rather a splendid thing. It looks a little like a pair of bellows, but uh, nonetheless, it worked uh, rather well and um, indeed was very precisely made. But since then, uh, things have come on a bit, and this is what we might see today. Mammoth is a passive electronically scanned array. In other words, you have an amplifier, then you have some phase shifters, then it goes to the antenna. This is a photograph of the Eurofighter's TR module and is what we refer to as an active electronically scanned array. In other words, a signal comes in here, gets phase shifted, amplified on the individual chip, and then out to the antenna. And this is 64 and a half millimeters long. All of this. Uh, you have gallium nitride power amplifiers here. The rest of it is almost certainly on gallium arsenide. And over here is a circulator, which is a, a magnetic device that allows you effectively to do without switching the power at the output end. Um, this is the array on the nose of an actual aircraft. And uh, I should say there are, I have to look at the numbers for this, I'm afraid, uh, there are 1,424 of these modules in a radar like that, each with its own antenna. And this comes to about one and a half million euro, so they're not dead cheap. But uh, on the other hand, uh, it's, it, it's quite an impressive piece of kit, uh, you know, worth every penny, I'm sure. Um, in fact, we don't have the specs for this, but we do have them for the F-22's radar for some reason. Uh, and they claim 100 to 150, 120 to 150 miles range against a one square meter target. So for earlier, we assumed 100 square meters for a, a big German wartime bomber. Now Stealth, of course, has got it down far below that. And uh, a 20 kilowatt peak power output, so the same as the Mammut radar. The difference, though, is that it does all of the phase shifting electronically. And that means that it can scan from one side to the other across its roughly 120 degree forward facing scan in about a hundredth of a microsecond. That means you can track lots of missiles, lots of incoming targets very, very quickly because you don't have to wait for your dish to go send a pulse, scan back and find the next thing. Just goes like that. Uh, oh, on the right, this is another phase shifter. This is actually a, an IC and uh, for scale, this is 400 microns across there. Uh, this is from a 2014 paper. Would anybody care to guess what this is for? Anybody? Come on, somebody must know. No, I've shown this to some of you before. Come on, this is ridiculous. Oh, well, this is actually, uh, this is a, a phased array driver. It has power amplifiers and phase shifters for 16 channels at 77 gigahertz, way into millimeter wave. And this is, perhaps in a few years' time, going to be in the bumper of your car. So, uh, admittedly, it's still at the luxury end of the market uh, at the moment, but give it a few years and I think we'll see it coming, uh, becoming more and more widely used. And uh, this rather begs the question, what else have I missed? <laughs> well, I said death rays seemed like an impractical idea, and once again, the US military has put me to shame, because this is the active denial system. It works at 95 gigahertz, 3 millimeter wavelength, and it has 100 kilowatts of power output using... Uh, some of you will doubtless be pleased to hear none of these modern transistor bit things, but gyrotrons, which is a sort of heavy-duty magnetron, basically. And uh, these have about a kilometer range, very, very high-gain antenna, because, of course, a wavelength is about, well, less than the size of one of the screws you can see on there. It's tiny. And as a result, as well, it doesn't go very far into the skin. Apparently, it's rather like standing in front of a really hot oven. You have to dive down and get on the floor, but it doesn't do you any serious injury. And here's the rub, really. It's not a death ray. So I think uh, Watson, Watt and, um, Watson, Watt and Wilkins can rest, uh, rest peacefully here. In fact, Spencer Ackerman from Wired volunteered to have another go, having been blasted once by the Pentagon's pain ray. Um, I am coming towards the end of what I've uh, prepared to say, but uh, don't worry, because I, am rarely, I rarely find myself completely without words, uh, uh, because I have some thoughts on the future of microwave engineering. We've covered 
a very much potted history to date. And now let's look at what might happen in the future. The solid-state microwave oven is not as far off as you might think. In fact, there is one. You can, I think, buy it already. Uh, it's, I, I'm not sure I would. Uh, it has lithium-ion batteries on board, and the premise is you can carry it off camping with you. It's smaller than a thermos flask, and I think it chucks out about 200 watts of RF. And you can heat up your drinks on the go, so long as you don't want to do it more than once or twice without charging the batteries, uh, because unfortunately it's very difficult to match the power density of a can of butane with a lithium-ion battery. So, uh, yes, I, I, I retain a bit of cynicism about whether the portable aspect of that's going to catch on, but magnetrons have quite a limited service life in commercial service, and it's very plausible that we'll see solid-state replacements in the next few years. NXP have a chip that does uh, 350 watts, uh, 250 watts CW at 2.5 gigs, uh, designed for microwave applications, and this is uh, becoming more and more common. Communications. I've not really said very much about communications beyond hinting at the microwave backbone, television relays and things. Of course, uh, on that note, I forgot to mention, but we all, uh, I'm sure, have seen the BT Tower or the GPO Tower or whatever you want to call it, and that was originally built for microwave television relay dishes. Um, but things have come on a bit in terms of modulation. Of course, most of us probably have a smartphone in our pocket nowadays, and we want lots and lots and lots of data really quickly. And unfortunately, in order to do this, we tend to push what you can do in terms of modulation. And uh, this is, uh, I don't know what waveform this is, but a typical case might be uh, 64 QAM, quadrature amplitude modulation. And this makes several great demands on your amplifier, especially the base station side. It has to be very linear, because otherwise all your tones will get mixed up and you won't be able to decode anything. And uh, it has to be fairly powerful. Unfortunately, if you have a very varied envelope like this, and this is the sort of problem they face, then actually the total output power varies dramatically second to second and microsecond to microsecond. And as a result, all of this power here is dissipated in your transistors. It's wasted. And so what would be rather nice is if you can skim the feed power to your transistors down and massage it. It's known as envelope shaping, and there is a fair bit of research going on around the world in this at the moment. I think uh, I'm, I'm not the best qualified here to say this by the long run, but I think uh, it may well come in in the next few years. It may even be in service already. I'm not quite sure. The final thing, as with everything in this life, is to make it cheaper. And we love things to be cheap. Uh, I can't think why. But um, one of the ways of doing this is to move it onto a cheaper substrate. I flicked very quickly through my slide on microwave transistors, but common substrates are gallium arsenide for lower power stuff, gallium nitride, uh, which is, has a very much higher breakdown voltage, so you can run it much harder uh, for power amplifiers, and various other you know, more edge case things. Uh, but <coughs> silicon is an awful lot cheaper, and there has been a lot of progress in recent years in pushing low microwave applications onto silicon. Um, NXP's LDMOS series is quite well known in the amateur community, and they go up to the low cellular bands on laterally diffused silicon MOSFETs, which, of course, keeps the cost nice and well down. Rest assured, I, uh, I am finishing. Getting there. You know, I'll go for coffee in a minute. And uh, I'm just going to summarize what I've said. I've forgotten, haven't you? Uh, we started out with J.C. Bose and his microwave experiments. A quick overview of his predecessors in the electromagnetic world, but then we were slightly peeved that we couldn't make a death ray and perhaps relieved that Hitler didn't have one either. We followed Allied radar development uh, through from detecting that there was a metal airplane somewhere to being able to have airborne radar that would pinpoint a submarine or an aircraft at several kilometers range and have looked at what happened since. Radio has been everywhere and is continuing to proliferate, especially in the microwave bands. And uh, it's all got smaller because of transistors. It's all getting cheaper because of the massive quantity we produce it in. And now we can do electronic beam forming. And please excuse me, a point I forgot earlier, which is uh, well worth mentioning. Electronic beam forming is not just for the Eurofighter and its one and a half million Euro radar, because at least my Wi-Fi router at home does it too. It steers the beam in the direction of your device, not quite as accurately, perhaps, as 1,424 different antennas, but it does give you a signal boost. And uh, the change is still ongoing. We're going to see more and more digitization at earlier stages, I think, and this is already coming through. And FPGAs nowadays, with phenomenal data converters built into them, are very much on the market. Uh, Zilinx is a name that springs to mind. Uh, thank you very much for your patience and bearing with me through my uh, incompetence with the various audio... Um, techniques involved in public speaking and uh
Thank you for listening. Cheers. Manda mandatory RSB closing slide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're perhaps wondering why I'm here. Uh, I'm, I can't. <laughs>